all for being here and uh, listening to just one more research update. You've just listened so attentively um, to updates about the scientific research and the perennial polycultures that's going on in each of the other programs of the Land Institute. Uh, what's happening here, if you step back from the detailed annual updates and just think about that bigger picture, what's happening here with perennial plant breeding and ecological intensification is genuinely new. Uh, this huge shift um, that's happening with how we think about agriculture. Um, I expect that many of you Prairie Festival regulars and friends of the land, um, if you think back to Prairie Festival's past, maybe can recall the moment that you sort of experienced this insight about what it means to address the problem of agriculture. Um, or maybe there are some of you who this good news is just dawning on today. For me, as someone who cares about language as well as plants and soils, one of the effects of grasping this transformation of agriculture is that I no longer call good and exciting work groundbreaking. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> or pioneering <laughs> or trailblazing. Um, the list can go on. Uh, groundbreaking just doesn't seem like an appropriate way to identify what's praiseworthy anymore. So with this in mind, I'm going to try another kind of big picture uh, way of thinking, an imaginative thought experiment to introduce ecosphere studies to you. So say we all agree that what's happening here at the Land Institute offers the potential for turning this 10,000 year or so trajectory of agriculture. It's been on this path and we're starting to turn it. So can you, can each of you, use your minds to kind of trace the path of that turning with me forward in time so keep following it and imagine this future community I've just invoked for whom it will be totally sensible and obvious to not break ground, even with all the old tools of dominion to do so at their disposal. Uh, this new community, can you imagine, who will choose not to genocidally settle new lands or pioneer a new carbon pool? Can you imagine such a community in which nature as measure, this paradigm, is accepted as common sense rather than radical? Can you imagine a community by which broken ground heals? And as you imagine such a community, can you imagine all of the ways in which their lives might be different than ours? Can you imagine how they take care of each other, what kind of language they'd use or not use, how they would move through their days, how they would teach their children? So, Hopefully, uh, you can conjure that image in your mind, imagine it, use your uh, mental powers of uh, homo sapiens, and pay close attention to the image that's emerged for you mentally. Is it blurry? Is it in clear focus? Are you seeing a community from the past? Are you remembering something? Are you seeing an aspect of your own cultural tradition? something that's been marginalized and needs to be brought back to the center? Are you seeing some other contemporary culture that's different from yours that we need to pay attention to again? Are you sensing that there's something more that you can't yet see? There's something unprecedented. Um, in that imagination of the future community, are you just seeing a group of humans standing there? Where is there? Who's in that group and who's out? What do those humans look like? Are there non-humans? Can you stretch the boundaries of that community per Leopold more than human? In your imagination, do you notice yourself uh, reproducing something that you already believe or know or feel? It's just kind of being articulated. Or what history has informed what you can imagine, what's possible? What limits are shaping your ability to imagine this something new in the future? What might be the source of what you can imagine? Where is that coming from? So the question I'm posing is, what would be required to refresh your imagination of what's really possible and of real paths to get there? Aubrey and I are going to go back and forth, and then Wes will get up and say whatever he wants. Uh, <clears throat> correct us. Good afternoon. Um, we think that what is required to imagine and then live into the future is a new understanding of where we humans are in the first place and from whence we came. Ecosphere studies is a way of seeing Earth as the creative, living globe that is our home. 
Rather than viewing Earth as a planet composed of living and non-living parts and people as separate from our environments, an ecospheric perspective understands human communities as nestled within ecosystems. We are part of an intricately interdependent system from which came an emergent property of life. Humans inhabit a living ecosphere as members of a community, as many indigenous and traditional cultures have long understood. The name ecosphere is in fact a way of naming the renewed relationship that we seek, now informed also by contemporary science that tells the story of an unfolding cosmos. Human agriculture is part of this journey. In the cultivation of annual monocultures of grain crops, agriculture has been a problem because it's based on unsustainable extraction and it creates surpluses and eventually a surplus way of thinking that has trouble thinking about anything else. Surplus, surplus, surplus. And we see that in our global obsessions with consumerism and economic growth. While diminishing the planet into parts, parts that become trapped in a domination subordination dynamic, surplus agriculture and its analogs have also pro promoted species extinction, human population growth, climate change, and social injustice. The Land Institute's Natural Systems Agriculture has recognized and started to address the problem of agriculture through plant breeding and ecological intensification. And what our research program in Ecosphere Studies is suggesting is that the insights of the whole long-range vision of the Land Institute's work can be applied more broadly in other areas to enact social and cultural change. If we seek, quote, a community life at once prosperous and enduring, as the Land Institute's mission pictures for us, we need to deeply understand history and to open our minds to a breadth of possibility. We need what, Al what philosopher Alfred North Whitehead calls a refreshment of the imagination. So Ecosphere Studies is really investigating how to change the way we think about our place in a living planet. So the question then is how? What's the method for changing the mainstream human agricultural mind bent on surplus at any cost that's now soaked in petroculture, uh, changing this mind into a livable post-growth sunshine future? Is change even possible? What is the precedent for humans living voluntarily within limits? Is there any? Is this within our human nature? Well, biophysical ecospheric limits are always already here and they are not negotiable. Change is already upon us as the consequence of our own human actions. We are going to need to preserve and hold on to human capacities for knowledge and we're gonna to need to keep acknowledging our ignorance. I mean, we have to recognize the complexity of reality. There may not be a simple catalyst or a simple way to predict what, which catalyst is going to make an everyday interaction on Earth into a transformatively ecospheric one. So as Wes likes to say, we have to proceed by rigor, not by recipe. So over the last three years, Ecosphere Studies has been building a constitu constituency generating and testing ideas and educating ourselves on key principles drawn from ancient insights, indigenous and traditional wisdom, and a cr critically self-reflective modern science. In 2017, this past June, we started to gather strength and bring clarity to the roles of the main team. In addition to Wes's leadership, I've been able to devote more time to the project thanks to grant funding, and Aubrey is here at the Land Institute full-time now as a postdoc. This past June, we held an Ecosphere Studies gathering here in Salina, where our group of about 30 people dug into the pivotal ideas of process and emergence with the help of John Cobb, a whitehead and process philosopher and theologian, Bob Ulanowitz, a physicist who writes on emergence and process ecology, and Bob Mesley, author of the book Process Relational Philosophy. Sounds like pretty heady stuff. <laughs> Um, then in July, we collaborated with faculty in the arts, sciences, and environmental studies at the University of Kansas, 
to hold a weekend workshop in ecosphere studies with students from KU and the Kansas City Art Institute. The art and science students participating in this workshop helped us imagine how ecospheres, ecospheric thinking might move us across multiple scales of space-time, challenge us to integrate what has been divided, and require stamina for ambiguity and uncertainty. Ecosphere studies isn't about trying to make a grand unified theory or prescribe a single way for people to live or drag and drop a standard curriculum into every existing institution. Instead, we look for multiple and diverse communities to emerge from the ways our human capacities for knowledge and imagination are shaped by a variety of places. Places, dynamic matrices of creatures and things and forces and processes. We're convinced that we need to change how we think and the why is increasingly evident, but to engage our operating question of how to make change, we've deci decided upon and designed this kind of experimental process, this is just coming into focus over the last month, to guide our work in 2018 and the next few years. So here's the kind of working hypothesis um, behind these experiments I'm gonna tell you about. If a shift to monocultural grain agriculture about 10 or 12,000 years ago changed human society and culture in definitive ways, changing our species relationship to the planet and actually changing the planet, the ecosphere, then a shift to a new ecological agriculture now could also be able to change human society and culture, mediating our new relationship to the planet, the ecosphere. So the idea is to simultaneously test out a variety of methods um, for sort of trying out this hypothesis through these six experiments that Bill and I are gonna talk you through. The experiments um, will influence each other, they'll change as we go. Some may fade out quickly, um, may not with, withstand the stress. Um, others might provide the right spark at the right time and still others might persist for quite a while before we get meaningful results. So the first experiment we've called intellectual grounding. Um, it involves bringing diverse collaborations of scholars together to produce and publish uh, foundational documents um, and develop a sort of seed bank of key concepts and ideas we'll use for teaching. Many of these folks are here today. Um, I'm not sure who's come and gone, so I won't call out names, but if you've been involved in Ecosphere Studies gatherings, would you just stand up for a moment, a wave, um, so people can visit with you. I see John, I see Valentin, I see Bob Jensen, many great people over here. So thank you all, um, and we are looking for involving more people. If you'd like to talk more about past work, don't hesitate to visit with us or these people. So we're drawing on knowledge from a variety of disciplines and practices to get a grasp on the kind of course correction that's necessary uh, and to reframe how we understand both problems and solutions. The second experiment is teaching in workshops. So this involves creating curriculum and training workshop leaders so that we can offer multiple public workshops per year at different locations for different audiences. We're interested in engaging people of a variety of ages in formal school settings um, and beyond. So in 2018, we're planning public workshop offerings in Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, and more. And we already know the details for the Colorado workshop. Um, it's gonna be called Enacting the Ecosphere Story. It will be June 11th through 13th at Western State Colorado University in Gunnison as part of their Summer Teacher Institute. Participants will interrogate the dominant narrative of agriculture that views the planet as made for humans and humans as made to rule the planet. And then participants in this workshop will start to imagine and begin to enact alternative stories rooted in their own histories, current realities, and futures of their diverse places and of the larger human place in the ecosphere. Experiment number three. We all know that not every student or learner is between the age of five and 21 who can go off to school for a semester or for a year or for many years or maybe has the money to do that. So we want to uh, uh, create some open access learning as part of Ecosphere Studies to create and publish freely available online resources such as multimedia videos, guided reading lists, and maybe even courses. We want to make this available to anyone who is interested. 
Experiment number four is to connect what we do um, in ecosphere studies with community resilience, which is going on around the country and around the world. In this case, with the Land Institute in Salina as the ecosphere studies hub, as we imagine it, we want to explore collaborations and public events with local education, government, and, and city planning, food production, medicine and health, businesses, churches, and activists, nonprofits here in the Smoky Hill watershed. Experiment number five is to take this idea of building resilience into building a network beyond this hub and to develop partnerships with organizations that are doing similar things to what we're doing, uh, doing it in different ways, ways in which we can all learn from each other. So we, in experiment number five, we want to engage with other groups whose, works align, whose work aligns with ours to develop broader networks of relationship at regional, national, continental, and global skills, and to partner on shared investigations. And we are beginning to work uh, with an organization in uh, California at Claremont called Ecological Civilization, and their partners in China. So we're already um, starting to, to, to reach out and, and begin to build relationships. And finally, experiment number six, creative expressions. Ecosphere studies is not just hair shirts and boring philosophy lectures, right? We want to have fun. We want to dance. We want to sing. Uh, we want to write poetry. We want to connect with artists. We want to celebrate the ecosphere. We want to create an ecosphere aesthetic. And so we want to reach out and create mutually beneficial partners with artists, writers, musicians, and curators working on projects that illuminate the ecosphere aesthetically, artistically. So those are the six experiments. We are serious about using this term following the scientists. Their idea of experiments is maybe different from ours, although maybe the metaphor is accurate. We do want to put some seeds into, into people's minds and, and, and to grow them out and see, see what we get. Uh, hopefully, uh, well, we will have some of David Van Tassel's uh, successes uh, or not successes, uh, maybe with drought and other kinds of things, but that's the nature of these things. But we're serious about this term. We have hunches and hypotheses, but as Wes likes to say, we just don't know. But we're trying to drive knowledge out of its categories and explore the ramifications of process and emergence and the counterintuitive behavior of social systems. So we just don't know what we'll find or what we'll learn until the experiments take root and express themselves. We will be surprised and confused and no doubt frustrated along the way but hopefully, hopefully we will also learn and be guided by the experiments themselves and not by our preconceived expectations. And we look forward to working with others in a shared community of exploration. You can find a webpage with more information about Ecosphere Studies on the Land Institute's website. And over the coming months, we'll update that page with publications, reading materials, and information about how to register for, a work, for workshops as they're announced. So I'll just end by reiterating what Bill has said. And most of all, please consider yourself invited to keep imaginatively experimenting with us. Maybe that community we imagined in which nature as measure is common sense, a community in which groundbreaking is only pejorative, a community in which education enables children and students of all ages to heal social and ecological injustices, a community that is ready to reckon with the complex and unfolding truths of the ecosphere. Maybe those of you here now can feel the stirring of such a community, even if none of us can quite see it yet. Thank you. Imagine that's 1800. Could any of you imagine that you would ever sit in a classroom or read on your own? That if you're on a train and there is a clock and you are passing a train station in which there is another clock uh, in the same time zone 
that that clock on the train will run slower than the clock on the, on the uh, platform. None of us, I don't think, could have imagined it. It's even now that we can imagine it, we have to think hard about it. But Einstein has proof that that would be the case. And furthermore, at the speed of light, there is no time. Now we're not calling on something that dramatic. <laughs> but we are counting on surprises. We've had lots of them. What we are counting on, though, is what seems to have been a recipe for people like Sir Isaac Newton, uh, Charles Darwin, Henry David Thoreau, and Theodosius Dobjonsky. Uh, Newton had finished four years at Trinity College, but he left after those four years because of the plague. And where did he go? He went back to his home and to the countryside where he uh, walked through the fields and over the farms, and as George Wald put it, got something of an intuition about the nature of the universe. It was the outdoorsness as well as the formal knowledge. I'm thinking maybe there ought to be half time outdoors. Um, I think it's probably clear, as weird as this guy was, Henry David Thoreau, uh, first in his class, I guess, that without Harvard or Emerson, he would have been nothing more than a small town eccentric. His outdoorsness, he needed Emerson, he needed Harvard, but he also needed that other. Uh, Charles Darwin was in the woods and in the fields and with his gun shooting and having a hell of a fine time. Uh, not very much serious in the classroom. He got on the beagle five years later. This is the man that gave us the great transformation. And Theodosius Dobzhansky, a man who came from the Ukraine, where they have a tradition of natural history, spent a lot of time there when he came to Columbia and worked on Drosophila flies, fruit flies, in Morgan's lab and studying the chromosomes. Genetics started really in 1900. He's in there after all that, but a new language was developing among the geneticists that was very separate from the naturalists, but he puts it together in 1936 or 7, genetics and the origin of species. And so ecology and evolutionary biology could then really become one and take off. What did it take? It took the formal and it took the outside engagement of the world. I'm tempted to think we got to have half time using the opposable thumb on the hand that created the 1350 cubic centimeter brain and we may not get to anything as deep as two different clocks one running slower on the train that's passing the station. But we're going to find something because we're drilling down and we're going to have lots of intellectuals through this place and we're going to try to think as deeply as possible what we must do and we're going to be constantly reminding ourselves we're over 400 parts per million. 
we got to do something and call on sources that we've not had available in a world running primarily on a reductive approach that has made it possible for us to even think about this all out of the 1600s. That's who we are. Thank <laughs> you.